right, ladies and gentlemen, how good are we if we discuss a book in the biggest venue of this uh, big building? I think we're really good. We're, uh, it shows our intellectual hunger. And um, we're going to steal it this evening here and uh, next door because there will be a reception with snacks afterwards. And uh, that will be in uh, more than an hour. But um, that's not too long. I, I think it's actually too short. But I, I was asked to uh, open the, the side event just as the, uh, the uh, founder of CPDP. CPDP is a conference that starts tomorrow. It's in this venue. And we always um, uh, value a lot the side events and, and the opening events because that, that gives us the flavor of what's coming. And that, that is um, something we always wanted to um, make these side events as uh, pre-event side events as interesting as the conference itself. And I think we're doing well this evening. Uh, we have an excellent panel and an excellent moderator that's going to take over my role. That is John. John, are you there? You are now um, officially introducing the panel and opening the panel. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, good evening, folks. It's very nice to see so many people here because this is a very important event, in my opinion. Um, we're here to talk about a book that some of us have been waiting for for 20 years. And finally, it's, uh, it's here. Um, its significance, I think, is that um, for many years, those of us who have been concerned about what the so-called digital revolution is doing through our societies have been scrabbling away at bits of the story. Um, and over those over the last 20 years, we've done quite a lot of work, scholarly work, journalistic work, um, media work, and so on. But when I look at what we've achieved, or what we had achieved, um, what comes to my mind is the old fable about the blind men and the elephant. You know the story? Blind men are asked to uh, give a description of the elephant, and each of them comes up with a description of his or her, his bit of the elephant. And essentially, that's what, we've, that's what we've had up to now. Um, which is why, although there's endless research and shelves in libraries groaning under the number of books about, about digital technology and its impact, our current state is still what Emmanuel Castells called many years ago now. He described as informed bewilderment. That's where we are just now. And the reason why Susanna Zuboff's book is so important is because for the first time we have a scholar who has made a serious attempt to paint the whole elephant. And this makes it different. There hasn't been a book like this before about, about the implications of digital technology for society. So that's the, the reason for celebrating and for devoting time to this evening. Now, in addition, we also have three scholars uh, on our panel who will respond to what Susanna says after she's had her say. Uh, we have David Murkami Wood, who's next to Susanna. Uh, he's currently a Canada Research Chair in Surveillance Studies at Queen's University in Ontario. He's a widely published specialist in the sociology and geography of surveillance, with a particular focus on Japan, Brazil, Canada, and the UK. In addition, he is the co-editor-in-chief of the international peer-reviewed journal, Surveillance and Society as well as a consultant and media commentator on surveillance issues. Then next to him is Francesca Ria, who is the Chief Technology and Digital Innovation uh, Officer for the City of Barcelona, which in this context is one of the most interesting cities in Europe. She's the founder of the Decode Project, an EU-wide effort to reclaim data sovereignty for citizens. She has a background in social science and innovation economics. She was a senior project lead at Nesta in Britain, uh, in the Innovation Lab. She's the EU coordinator of the Decent Project on Direct Democracy and Social Digital Currencies and the principal investigator of the DSI Project on Digital Social Innovation in Europe. And then we have Paul Nemitz. He's the director responsible for fundamental rights and union citizenship in the Directorate General Justice of the European Commission. Before joining DG Justice, he held posts in the legal service of the Commission, the Cabinet of Commissioner Nielsen, and in the Directorates General for Trade, Transport, and Maritime Affairs. He has a broad experience as an agent of the Commission in litigation before the European Courts, and he has published extensively on EU law. He was admitted to the bar in Hamburg, 
and obtained a Master of Comparative Law from George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC, where he was a Fulbright scholar. But recently, the most interesting thing from my point of view is a few weeks ago, the Royal Society in London published a landmark paper by him on the ethics and regulation of artificial intelligence. So what we have is a really important book, the author of that book, and three very distinguished panelists. We'll talk for a while after Suzanne has finished, and then we want to hear from you. And as a moderator, I'd really like a good row. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. My goodness. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how, how uh, grateful I am to Rosamund and the CPDP for organizing this evening. Um, it's really such an honor for me and, and more importantly for this book. And uh, to be up here on the stage with these individuals who I, I, I as, as an intellectual, I just worship them and their work. Uh, John's contribution and David, Francesca, what she's doing in, in Barcelona and uh, her vision for the EU and Paul is an incredible champion of democracy. It's just such an honor to, to be here with all of you tonight. I, I'm, I'm just beside myself with uh, awe. Um, can I see your copy of the book uh, for a second, John? Because uh, your copy is a... Uh, a little bit of a preview of what the hard cover looks like because it's quite a thick book. <laughs> um, and uh, um, what I try to tell people is even though Amazon says it's a 704 page book, actually the text is only 524 pages plus a paragraph. So more like a good uh, weekend read, you know, than uh, <laughs> an encyclopedia. But, uh, my point in saying that is that, you know, I'm not going to stand up here for 20 minutes and try to summarize the book for you, um, but I, I thought I would do a little bit of framing of what the book is intended to do and why I wrote it, and then uh, maybe end with reading you just a couple of paragraphs from the book that really summarize a lot of my, my feelings and a lot of my motivation for, for writing it. So, you know, the first thing I want to say is, um, you know, sometimes people are reluctant to date themselves, but in this instance, I think I shall do, and say that I first started studying the digital and its effect on organizations and work and society in the year 1978. And, it was pretty quickly in that effort that um, I had an insight that really drove me through the following decades. And that insight was that um, information technology was always going to detonate a new kind of political conflict. Because information technology, unlike other technologies, produces information and the possibility of new knowledge. And new knowledge will always be a contested territory. And the way I, the way I would summarize the political conflict, conflicts over this contested territory is three questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? And who decides who decides? These are the entangled dilemmas of knowledge, authority, and power. In the first part of my career, it was possible to study these dilemmas and how they affected one another and the contests over them uh, in the confines of the workplace. And, and that's what I did. I was focused on the workplace and, and its implications for work and the managerial hierarchy and all of that. By the uh, 21st century, that was becoming um, clearly uh, an early phase of something much, much larger. Because now these same contests, who knows, who decides, who decides, who decides, are contests that every single one of us is entangled in. No longer confined by the boundaries of the workplace or of any institution, we are all users 
And as users, we are all part of this new political conflict. In my view, this conflict shifts the social ordering of our society from a division of labor characteristic of the 20th century to a division of learning, which is ushered in with this productivity, this fecundity of the digital era and this new uh, production of, of knowledge. The division of learning, the division of learning in society. So obviously I'm, I'm taking a page from Durkheim here in a certain way, in the sense that Durkheim wrote about not only the division of labor, but the ways in which the division of labor could be disfigured, pathological, abnormal, controlled by elite power and against the interests of a democratic society. In the past 20 years, we've seen the rise of something that I've come to call surveillance capitalism. And I regard surveillance capitalism now as, as having had a relatively free run for these last two decades. Relatively, in some countries more than others, more than others, but still relatively unimpeded by law. Relatively unimpeded by social resistance. In the book, I describe 16 explanations for this long, successful run of surveillance capitalism. Among them, of course, is the fact that it's surveillance capitalism, which is to say, from the start, it understood that it had to be um, shrouded in the social relations of the one-way mirror, ergo surveillance that if it actually stepped up in front of us and looked us in the eye and said, may I take your private experience, please? May I take your private experience as free, raw material? And may I render that private experience as behavioral data, please? And then may I use those behavioral data to make predictions, to combine it with my unique proprietary computational capabilities, artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, and with that to discern predictive patterns and from those predictive patterns to fabricate prediction products about your behavior and others' behavior. May I do that, please? And then may I sell those prediction products to business customers with a commercial interest in understanding what you will do now, soon, and later so that I can gather together surveillance revenues and with that tremendous uh, profit earnings ratios and with that world historic accumulations of market capitalization. May I do that, please? Well, the answer would be no. And therefore, surveillance capitalism began from the start engineering, carefully, intentionally designing its methodologies to produce ignorance in its users, all of us. That ignorance has been the veil that has prevented us from carefully naming and understanding the fact that we are entrapped by an economic logic, not by technology, not by inevitability, not by a single corporation and its business model or its management practices, or for that matter, its management failures, but rather by a systematic, comprehensive comprehensive new economic logic, the basis for a new economic order in which the methodology of surveillance is the key to claiming private human experience for a new kind of marketplace that is about us but is not for us. Knowledge that is from us but sold to others to further their ends, and their commercial goals. <clears throat> I, spent <clears throat> I spent seven years just on this book. There was a lot of time before that kind of figuring out some of the basics, but seven years, more or less seven days a week, all of those years to complete this book. And I did it for one reason. And um, John, of course, with his normal uh, perspicacity, uh, goes right to the heart of it. I wanted to name this. I felt that we hadn't yet named it, and that if we are to tame surveillance capitalism, if we are to tether it to our own best interests, 
if we are to tether it to the interests and values and principles of a democratic society, then that taming can only begin with naming. And so that has really been my effort to, um, some would say, perhaps too tediously, but some would say just right, <laughs> to name the economic logic, its fundamental mechanisms, its economic imperatives, and then to extrapolate from these operations to their aims for society, the way in which society is brought into this lens as just another set of objects for extraction, prediction, influence, and control and ulti ultimately as more raw material for monetization in commercial markets. So <clears throat> naming. Um, I wanted to say that an, an, another sort of dimension that I've tried to address in the book is both the dimension of rights as they affect us as individuals and as they they impinge upon the existential structure of our lives, but also the way in which we, so in this existential perspective, we find that we are eroding democracy and the democratic prospect from the inside out because surveillance capitalism ultimately through its competitive dynamics is driven to find its most predictive behavioral data from actually intervening in the state of play, intervening in our behavior, and helping to shape and influence, tune and herd our behavior toward its commercial outcomes. And I offer that this is the basis for the um, commandeering the digital infrastructure largely built by surveillance capital commandeering this infrastructure for a new global means of behavior modification that is a fundamental challenge to human autonomy, to our right to the future tense. And with this challenge, we find a kind of erosion of democracy from within, because although it has become a cliche, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to worry about, my response to that is that if you have nothing to hide, you are nothing. That is to say that everything that makes us rich, worthwhile, and inner life, the inner resources from which we draw for moral courage, for autonomy, for self-determination, those inner resources are under siege when we live a life exposed to this new environment of stimulus response and reward and punishment bought and paid for by surveillance revenues. But we also see democracy being eroded from without. And here we come back to the division of learning in society. Because during these 20 years of more or less unimpeded growth, surveillance capitalism has garnered to itself an unprecedented asymmetry of knowledge and I've thought about this very carefully for many years now, and I honestly do believe that this asymmetry of knowledge that has been created within this institution owned and operated by private capital must be unparalleled in the history of humanity because they know everything about us and we know very little about them. Their knowledge is about us, but not for us. These asymmetries are truly revolutionary. Power accrues to knowledge, and asymmetries of knowledge, such as have been established, also produce asymmetries of power, the likes of which the world has never seen. I've gone to great pains to try and conceptualize this power distinguish it from totalitarianism, which I believe is a very important distinction because this is not a power that aims to murder us. It's not a power that aims to kill us. It's not a power that aims to destroy or even own our souls. This is a power that simply wants to shape us and be adjacent to us. It's a power that wants free access to our private experience 
for its own ends. I call it instrumentarian power because it takes command of the instrumented milieu of the digital and turns us into instruments of its own commercial goals. Instrumentarian power doesn't care if we are happy, but it does want to make sure that it has access to the data that springs from our joy. It doesn't care if we are sad, but it does want to ensure that it has access to the data that leeches from our anguish. Instrumentarian power is remote. It operates in the terms of radical indifference, but nevertheless, it is everywhere and it is powerful and it produces its own signature of violence. Its end game, its view of society in the future is a view in which computation replaces politics, where there is no more room for democracy, for contest. There is no more society. There is simply the absolutism of computation's right answers. Five minutes, good, perfect. And so I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a tour and a little bit of a, a sense of the highlights and the themes as a, as a, as a way for you to perhaps approach the book and, and shake hands and know a little bit about what my preoccupations have, have been um, and what kept me at this for, for so long and uh, turned my hair gray in many um, very distinctive ways that will be visible when you see me up close. I wanted to end with my last five minutes by reading you a couple of paragraphs from this book. These are paragraphs that are dear to my heart, um, and you'll see why when I begin to read them. But um, one of my key motivations that I haven't mentioned yet is that I have two children who are both in their 20s, 23, 26. And just as I, I, uh, I stay up at night worrying about their future in a world of uh, climate havoc, I also um, have lost a lot of sleep. In fact, during these years of writing, it's been really hard to sleep. Uh, thinking about um, if, if, if nature uh, is, what we, is what we have helped to destroy, uh, to destroy during the century of uh, industrial capitalism's dominance. Uh, is it now human nature that is in the sights of a new surveillance capitalism? Is it human nature that will be disfigured by a, by a new regime of instrumentarian power? Should we not gather in resistance? Should we not gather the resources of our democracies to finally draw a line and not allow this to stand. And so I wrote these paragraphs for my children and for all the people in this audience uh, who are you know, in your, in your 20s and 30s. And for the rest of you, I wrote it for your children and all the children. When I speak to my children or an audience of young people, I try to alert them to the contingent nature of the thing that has us by calling attention to ordinary values and expectations before surveillance capitalism began its campaign of psychic numbing. It is not okay to have to hide in your own life. It is not normal, I tell them. It is not okay to spend your lunchtime conversations comparing software that will camouflage you and protect you from continuous unwanted invasion. Five trackers blocked, four trackers blocked, 59 trackers blocked, facial features scrambled, voice disguised. I tell them that the word search has meant a daring existential journey, not a finger tap to already existing answers. That friend is an embodied mystery that can only be forged face to face and heart to heart, and that recognition is the glimmer of homecoming we experience in our beloved's face, not facial recognition. 
I say that it is not okay to have our best instincts for connection and information exploited by a draconian quid pro quo that holds these goods hostage to the pervasive strip search of our lives. It is not okay for every move, emotion, utterance, and desire to be cataloged, manipulated, and then used to surreptitiously herd us through the future tense for the sake of someone else's profit. These things are brand new, I tell them. They are unprecedented. You should not take them for granted because they are not okay. If democracy is to be replenished in the coming decades, it is up to us to rekindle the sense of outrage and loss over what it is being taken from us. In this, I do not mean only our personal information. What is at stake here is the human expectation of sovereignty over one's own life and authorship of one's own experience. What is at stake is the inward experience from which we form the will to will and the public spaces to act on that will. What is at stake is the dominant principle of social ordering in an information civilization and our rights as individuals and societies to answer the questions, who knows, who decides, who decides who decides. That surveillance capitalism has usurped so many of our rights in these domains is a scandalous abuse of digital capabilities and their once grand promise to democratize knowledge and meet our thwarted needs for effective life. Let there be a digital future, but let there be a human future first. Thank you. Okay, David, are you, do you want to, I think they're, they're all working, do you want to stay there or go up to the? I'm, I'm happy to stay here. This, okay. is, this is Shoshana's event and she should be the one standing up. Okay, I think I was really touched to hear that you're so delighted to share the stage with us. Believe me, um, we're infinitely more delighted to share, st share the stage with you. Um, this book, to start off with before I get into specifics, is, as you say, big. But as academics, we like big books and we cannot lie. Um, this is a book that also you know, captures the zeitgeist you know, perfectly. This is the right time for this book. It is a book that embodies the spirit of the age, and it's a necessary book. And whatever else I may say about it, and whatever other disagreements we may have, and we have some interesting and productive disagreements, um, that will never change. Now, surveillance capitalism, in its most basic form for me, is one of a series of spatial, of a series of fixes that have evolved to, you know, basically fight crises of accumulation within capitalism. Um, Professor Zuboff quotes David Harvey talking about the spatial fix of globalization earlier in the book, and it's, it's certainly true that this particular series of fixes, and it isn't just one, it's a multiple series of fixes that comes in at this point, um, and surveillance capitalism may be indeed one of another whole wider range of such fixes, aims to kind of commodify those areas of our lives that have so far remained uncommodified. Uh, it aims to commodify our thoughts, our behavior, our intimate relationships. The wonderful book that is not as big as um, Professor Zubos, but is still an incredibly worthwhile book by Jonathan Clary called 24-7, which some of you may have come across, mm -hmm. which he looks at the way in which sleep remains one of the few frontiers of human experience that remains uncommodified by capitalism. Just as I was preparing these notes, I, found, I got told of several different Internet of Things devices that are now in doing exactly this. Different watches and indeed a surveillance pillow that starts to turn our sleep into data. Um, so, you know, this, these last frontiers of human intimacy and privacy are vanishing day by day, minute by minute. And I agree also very importantly that this particular series of fixes for capitalism is not about labor. I think many of us in the academic community have made the mistake in the past of attributing all of this to a new kind of labor. Both Nick Cernicek and Shoshana Zuboff say that it is not labor. This is actually the movement of capitalism into areas which are precisely new kinds of exploitative functions. And I think one of the mistakes we've made as scholars and activists is saying that this could be treated in the same way as previous forms of capitalist exploitation by dealing with those simple facts of labor exploitation. It's much more than that. Labor exploitation hasn't gone away, but this is something new and different. 
I think um, I want to focus just my, my brief comments here on the future and some questions about the future. There's many critical comments this makes. We, I could make this arguments we could have, and we will. But today, this is a launch, and I'm interested in furthering the discussion and thinking about the future. I'm interested, first of all, in the possibility of real politics. At the end of the remarks just now, Professor Zubov focused on that issue of how we can reconstruct and rethink politics, or at least democracy. We're living in an age of anti-politics, of a denial that politics is even important anymore. Um, politics is uncool. Politics is not possible. Politics is vanishing into machines and into corporations. Whether we call it platform capitalism or surveillance capitalism, it's a new mode which seems to threaten to efface not only old methods of organization, but old methods of decision making, including democracy. And at the end of the book, there's a really, it's a really sad moment, I think, when you get the feeling that the technological constraints imposed by surveillance capitalism might even prevent the possibility of reconstructing politics at all. This is something I've thought about as well. I've called it ambient government. You call it something different. But um, this is something I really worry about. And how far, can we, how far do we go before it's too late? Um, many people have thought about this in the past. It's always a concern we have. But I think it's a much realer concern now than it ever has been. In the same way that the kind of critiques that are being made have also been made before in some ways. You know, when I think of the idea of this instrumentarian sort of slavery, it reminds me of the human batteries in the Matrix or Philip K. Dick's in, you know, kind of uh, worlds of effacement and worlds of deception. But I also worry that we're stuck in some ways in where the solutions are coming from. I'm slightly worried about the fact that nostalgia often seems to provide the answers or the sources of, of where the answers come from. Um, and I, I think it's not surprising that we do this. This is our comfort zone. This is our space. We return to home when we're looking for answers. And there's some beautiful writing about this in the book. But I also think this is actually a dangerous place to go. Nostalgia is also the source and the rationale for why we now have a resurgence of authoritarianism in the world. It's that running back to daddy to tell us everything is safe and it's okay, that we can be protected from those nasty outsiders that comes from that nostalgic place when everything was good, everything was bright, everything was beautiful. And I think this is a dangerous turn and we have to think instead about how we build in the future whatever has existed in the past. I also think there's something of a danger in thinking about us in, in unproblematic ways. And, and while it's really great that we can talk about humanity, We've got to recognize that the humanity we're talking of is not a singular public, it's not a singular us. There are people in this world who've experienced the kinds of damage, division, prejudice, destruction, genocide, that none of us who are white, middle-class male people like myself will ever know. And just because now we are all being divided up, and now people like me are starting to experience this kind of oppression, it doesn't mean this is a new oppression. And I think we have to acknowledge and we have to understand that people are coming from different spaces. One more minute or two. So I wonder what are the internal contradictions of surveillance capitalism, where we can look for breaks, where we can look for possibilities for rupture and for resistance. One of them, in fact, I think is the tension that's identified, and it is a tension, between these predictive products and the new instrumentarian control. Because in the end, the new instrumentarian control, for me, threatens to destroy the very foundation of what Google and others you know, have, have done to make these predictive products. Predictive products rely on an economy and a society in which error and, and uncertainty exist. On the other hand, the instrumentarian society seems to promise full certainty. This actually there will undermine and destroy the very basis of Google's predictive products you know, and its possibilities. So in itself, Google is sowing its own destruction. Other companies are sowing their own destruction here. This is not necessarily a bad thing. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for restarting politics and for rethinking politics. And you have to ask as well with instrumentarian control, not just is this the end of a particular kind of capitalism, but is this the end of capitalism altogether? Mackenzie Walk has been asking this question for a number of years now. And I think it's worth paying attention to that question that maybe this is already not capitalism. Maybe this is already something different and how we might deal with that question. And the other question, of course, is if it's not capitalism, do we really want capitalism back? In fact, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that the answer is to be found in some kind of um, nostalgic, again, um, idea of a social con contract-based capitalism, if that ever really existed for any number of people in a majority of any kind. 
I'm also uncomfortable then with the idea that somehow we can look to capitalism itself to find some of the answers, in particular corporations that say aren't Google and Facebook. I'm not one of those people who would hold up my iPhone as a revolutionary gesture against the FBI and say Apple will save us. I don't think Apple is a better corporation than Google or Facebook. I think it's just a cleverer corporation. We shouldn't trust any of them. They are not our friends. So the final question then is what do I, you, we, they want, and how should we go about getting it? I'm a big fan of things like platform cooperativism. I think there are possibilities for building and rebuilding community in new ways. I don't fear the kind of collectivism that seems to be a little bit of a concern of, of Professor Zubov's at the end. I think we can have a diminution of our own individuality to create better collective solutions, and I think that's necessary. Indeed, after all, isn't it that hyper-individualism that has led us to this place where loneliness is now an epidemic, as, as Professor Zuboff remarks in the book? We don't need to fetishize this kind of hyper-individualized capitalism in order to find a solution. In fact, we need something different from that, different from totalitarianism, and different from the kind of false solutions offered by seductive corporations like Apple. So that's where I'll end today, and I'll pass it on to Francesca Bria, who's of whom I'm also an incredible admirer, and, and I love what you're doing in Barcelona. Thank you very much. Um, I think I will take a very different approach and uh, really focus on the political implication or policy implication of Susanna's contribution. And first of all, well, I'm absolutely delighted to see you here. I tried so many times to get her to Europe and I miserably failed. So I'm very happy that you're here with us. And I think uh, for me it's um, also really great that this happens in this context because uh, my feeling is that we will need the collective intelligence of everybody here and much beyond to understand what kind of democratic movements and practical alternatives we need to move beyond surveillance capitalism. And in that respect, I think that um, beyond any kind of theoretical or analytical conversation that will, the book will absolutely, certainly uh, help to inspire, which I think is a great opportunity, uh, because of course she has a strong thesis. I mean, she uh, defines and names surveillance capitalism as a new economic um, logic as a new market form that, that is different from industrial and managerial capitalism that was based on some kind of social pact between the capitalist and society. So this is of course a strong thesis and I'm sure there will be a lot of theoretical and analytical debate. However, my role is to go beyond that and focus on the policy impact. And in particular, I think um, the great contribution is that she make us open our eyes and realize that the current policy debates about uh, the issue of even tech monopolies or privacy, the question of antitrust, the question of a digital tax, the question of even liberal democracy and, and the faith of liberal democracy that seems in danger because of specific business model, this fails to grab the systemic uh, challenge and dimension of the problem. And I have to say, a lot of policymakers, I mean, I'm a policymaker now in Barcelona, they do really fail to grasp the, what we are talking about, but also what we should be doing about it. So I think the, the real question that we should be asking is what is the new social pact in the digital society? And how we are able to uh, find the institutional conditions and the democratic movements that will help us go beyond surveillance capitalism. So it is an amazing, urgent call to action. And I think we should be all here to find out what is this democratic collective action that we need. So I think that what we need is uh, democratic control over digital platforms and put people's sovereignty first. So we need a new framework, which is a people-centric, rights-based digital society that doesn't use and doesn't monetize personal information and personal data and doesn't manipulate for commercial ends personal data to fund critical infrastructures. So this is the first thing, and I think we have to find um, what are the different models, what are the alternatives. 
um, I have to say that usually the big narrative that we have is the one that tells us that here we have a digital supremacy which is divided into two camps. On one side we have the Silicon Valley leaky surveillance capitalism that Shoshana so well defines in her book and on the other side we have a dystopian models with unlimited credit, credit data collection such as the Chinese credit um, social credit system. And these are the duopoly, um, US versus China. Absolute no space for Europe. Now, even though this may seem a bit too late and a bit naive, I will argue that actually it is in Europe that we can design and implement an alternative, or, there, or at least we have to work for that. But we need to move a little bit much beyond regulation uh, to propose practical and, and stronger alternatives. So I think we are going on the right uh, direction in, for instance, proposing a new framework about antitrust to revitalize competition law. I think this is a big topic in the US right now. Are we gonna break those platforms? What are we gonna do to limit their market monopoly power and enhance competition? Of course, we have the GDPR. You, I'm sure you will talk, Paul, about that, that protect our data sovereignty. And I think the right to be forgotten is close to some of the rights that you're advocating for our future tense or even the right to sanctuary. Yes, so we are in the right direction. We maybe are gonna have a digital tax in Europe, possibly, uh, that is gonna reward all of us for the collective production of the wealth in the digital economy. So this cannot be appropriated by very few companies that extract our data for profit while it doesn't trickle down in the population. So we need to redistribute the wealth created in the digital economy and of course we have important questions about national security and digital trade. However, let me say, we need to move beyond the regulation and maybe ground our different approach and alternative on a very strong approach regarding Europe's when it comes to rights. So the protection of fundamental rights is charted in the constitutional basis. And I think that was a great achievement to have data protection as an autonomous constitutional rights for citizens. And this is uh, what we have to build upon and also not fall um, into technological determinism or the primacy of the economic logic. Let me say though that I do not want to see this conversation to go into a binary choice as you also mentioned. For instance, we let the consumer alone, the kind of sovereign consumer individual to choose between, for instance, an AI driven healthcare system furnished by Apple that is gonna be very expensive and elitist because only a few people are gonna be able to pay for it but secure or an healthcare system furnished by uh, Google that's gonna be free but data leaky. So I do not think that this is the only alternative. We cannot be left with a model that is selling privacy and data sovereignty as a service. We need fundamental rights and we need to protect those rights. And I also think that um, we need to expand our institutional imagination to see what are the possibilities for other alternatives. For instance, why not hypothetically think that we can have distributed emancipatory alternatives that um, give data, I mean, that provide data as a common good. So data is controlled by citizens. We have strong encryption uh, so that we can protect fundamental rights. And this uh, data infrastructure would be a public good controlled by citizens with strong encryption and it can um, enhance different models of social coordination that are based on solidarity and not just profits. And in this way we can imagine that we can uh, produce um, the, the kind of AI driven healthcare, education, transportation, housing, all the services that are needed by society in a logic of solidarity. Yes, I'm going towards the end. This is absolutely important for me because for instance, I'm a city, I represent citizens and and what we're doing in Barcelona is exactly that. We are saying data sovereignty is a fundamental right. We are creating alternative infrastructures that are controlled by citizens. They are decentralized. They have encryption and human rights at the core. And then on top of that, we can unleash the talent of cooperatives and entrepreneurs and citizens themselves to build the public services that we need, which are going to be affordable for a society. So this is almost like rethinking the welfare state on the basis of solidarity which is the core of the European model. 
And let me just uh, also say that who is the agents for this collective change that we need? Who will be able to create this democratic institution that will protect our rights in the digital age? I do not think, again, that the agents of change will be the solitary, so, the, the alone consumer or we should leave um, individuals alone faces the big power. So we need alliances between cities, between states, progressive governments, political parties, social organizations like trade unions and collective institutions that are gonna enable us to really regain and take back democratic control in our digital society. And I think that's what is at stake. And just a last thing that I wanna say is, let's start from the infrastructure for democracy and participation. Now we're going to have a European election coming up. And I was just reading the news that, you know, Facebook is creating a war, um, a, like a, a war uh, control, you know, to monitor election, like a war room, which is based on their previous experience in doing that for the US election and Brazilian elections. We saw the dramatic output of that, we see a lack of trust in political institutions, a rise of right-wing nationalism in Europe at the moment, and we cannot let Facebook to solve these problems. So why don't we build our own political infrastructure for participation and democracy and deliberation, which are you know, based on fundamental rights, which are open source, uh, which have encryption and human rights and, and, and the rule of law, embedded into the, the core of the infrastructure and we govern themselves. This is feasible, we do it in Barcelona, we have it, we can scale it and make it a European platform and really we can build those infrastructure and we need to do that if we wanna get back the political and democratic control and enable people to fight for their future. Yes, I love to hear Francesca because I think this is <coughs> the important message which I also take uh, from Shoshana's book, which is it is possible. We are confronted with a man-made phenomenon and therefore we can change it. And I think what Shoshana describes is the politics or the failure of politics relating to an invisible risk. And this syndrome of invisible risk in politics, we have seen it before. We have seen it in atomic power, we have seen it in... Um, uh, the problems of environmental pollution and smoking. This is uh, very similar. First, the insiders know what needs to be done, and it takes time until others catch up because of the invisibility of the risk. If the risk is invisible, policymakers, members of parliament have hesitations, the populace has hesitations, but after a certain time, the measures follow. We have seen this in smoking, which is you know, banned in many places today. We have seen it in atomic power. So I'm quite optimistic that um, your book will help to move forward in the direction which Francesca is describing. Um, and it is possible, and I do believe, like Francesca, in getting organized again. And uh, getting organized means also to <coughs> realize that democracy is in a pincer movement between technology and populism. And they fire each other up. And uh, there is a lot of literature about populism, the dying of democracy, also American literature, European literature. But what you, Shoshana, have provided here is, um, let's say, the book of reference on the other side of the pincer movement. I always suspected that people lie to me when I say, come on, Facebook, Google, you just still secretly follow John Perry Barlow's declaration of the independence of cyberspace. You actually have not given up on that. And they say, no, Paul, no, we are Democrats, you know, and come on, we're even calling for the regulation of face, uh, uh, face recognition. But after having read your book, I, uh, I am now convinced uh, this is a lie. And you describe not only the very concrete steps to undermine democracy, you also make clear the, um, let's say, mechanics which lead uh, in this direction. And I think this is very, very important. I have uh, seen it in the work on GDPR where we were bombarded with any type of lobbyism you can imagine. And uh, we still have passed the law. 
Thanks also to the engagement of civil society actors, many of which are here today or will come during this week. This is actually, GDPR is the success story of civil society engagement because without the engagement of people uh, like Max Schrems, uh, for example, and his counterparts from Poland and from the Netherlands uh, um, uh, and so on, we would not have been able to muster the majorities and to work reasonably and come to good results with 4,000 amendments in the um, uh, parliamentary process. So um, I think uh, this is encouraging and there are other examples which are encouraging, which show that we can make laws and that does democracy work. And please don't understand me wrong, I completely sign up to what Francesca said, it's not only about laws. But it's important to realize that not only that law and technology and also financing have to go hand in hand and can sometimes substitute each other, but when we talk about democracy we have to realize that the law is the most noble expression of democracy. And when we talk about power, we also have to realize and admit that self-regulation and code of ethics, you know, they will bring some people over. There are good willing people and I do believe that corporate executives and corporate owners can make choices and we have to hold them account for choices. I don't believe in a totally deterministic model of, you know, they must do this because the market demands. Because if that would be like that, then we wouldn't have corporations which are more responsible than others. I sign up to the sentence, we should not, never trust, but choices can be made in the system. We should hold, them, uh, we should hold uh, uh, co uh, companies to account. But we also need the power of force of law in order to be able to enforce <coughs> the rights and the duties against those who don't play ball. We have seen the teaching of disruptive innovation goes so far that disrupting the law as part of our innovative model is absolutely okay. So we have a culture where corporations think they break copyright, they don't pay taxes, they don't respect privacy rights, and, and, and. And this is something where we just have to say stop, this is not on, and we must go for it with the force of the law, and I think in Europe we're quite good at doing this, we can still get better, but, you know, 11 billion to be paid by taxes in Ireland, decision of the Commission, we have GDPR, we have competition law, which must be applied in more modern ways, I'm not sure whether the law needs to be changed, and we also have in Germany the Netzdurchsetzungsgesetz, which I can guarantee you was passed in the Parliament in Germany in the last meeting before elections, only for one reason. And this is what this debate is about, to show that there is a primacy of democracy over capitalistic power and technology. And we know from Hans Jonas' principle of responsibility, which was the Bible of the environmental movement, that the combined power of technological innovation and capitalism brushes aside every other interest unless we stand against it. And so I take your book as a call for action, as a call to get organized. And in these movements, whether the environmental movement or the movement of social democracy or unions, it was always this process of naming, of enlightenment, of explaining, and then um, getting organized. And I would say um, it is very timely also because we need this call for action not only on the side of technology, but also on the side of uh, fighting populism. Now let me end um, with, um, let's say, an assignment for a next book, volume two, Shoshana Zuboff. I think what we need is for your book, a parallel manual, which tells people all the things which actually are already in place to counter the power and how they work. Because on the basis of the GDPR, if politics decides to give enough resources to DPAs, boy, can they go against the abuse of data. Boy, can people ask for what do you know and who knows. Just one example. So um, I think that's uh, the next volume which we need. We need to make known all the best practices and the good laws which are, on, are already in place. And we have to name and shame 
in particular before European elections, the failure of those who don't make sure that these institutions and these laws also work. And I would say there we are back to the word which you also use. We must name capitalism and we must name neoliberalism. And we must clearly say to people, when you have the choice to vote, think twice who you vote for in the European elections. Do you vote for those who undermine the law and who always say, let's do self-regulations, let's do ethics, oh, let's trust these companies, they're doing good things. Or do you vote for those who have a history of fighting for justice, for social equity, and for using and making democracy work for the people? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I've got a few questions for you. Um, the first one is for you, Susanna, which is um, one of the things that, that puzzled me at the, at the beginning is, is why I found your book um, such an illuminating um, work. And in fact, I think that you, you did the illumination earlier in, in a, at least one essay that you published in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. And it was the naming. And that, that made me kind of reflect on it a lot because I, I, I then, in retrospect, came to the feeling that one of the things that's been lacking in the way we think about this stuff is we were using concepts of what we were, of, of, the, of the, the monster we were dealing with um, that were too loaded with um, self-defeating kind of implications. So, for example, if you look at the, 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 the crowd that goes to Davos every year, um, they have been obsessed for years with something that they call the fourth industrial revolution. And then you have a lot of other folks who talk about the digital era. And in both cases, they're naming something that in, is implicitly technological d determinist. It basically says, this is what we're dealing with it. And there's nothing you can do about it really because it's just going to roll. And the, the, the really interesting thing about, about, about your term was that um, it, it separated it out and said, okay, this is only incidentally about technology in a way. Uh, it's about the way in which capitalism has found a way of, it, of using the technology. It could be used in many different ways for a particular purpose. And I think that was a really wonderful uh, um, insight and very powerful. Um, so I'm very grateful to you for that. Um, David, um, you raised a, a point about your response to the book, which was um, I, I kind of detected a sort of a, <clears throat> a high-minded uh, academic view of this, which is that there's too much passion in this book, you know. No? Okay. Um, so forgive me if I got that, if I got that wrong. But you, you also raised an interesting question, which is where, where are the... I mean, like Marx. Marx was looking for the internal contradictions of the capitalism he was writing about. Where are the inter internal contradictions here? I mean, for example, one, one possible internal contradiction is that, is that in, the one thing that is finite in all of this is human attention. I mean, you, you know, there, there are only so many, so many hours in a day when people can be fixated on addictive products from, from technology companies. And I've often wondered whether, well, there are two things. Either, what's going on at the moment is that the companies are continually trying to increase the amount of attention they get. Um, and one of my thoughts is, will this get to the point where it really gets to people? In other words, will you see the beginnings of, of, of the kind of popular d um, dissatisfaction that might then lead to the sort of politics that Francesca wants um, and, and that Paul talks about? Um, Francesca... Um, I think um, I, w I was, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, actually, we need a manual for, for a new kind of politics. Uh, and I suggest that you write it. Um, and Paul, one question, which is, um, I think you're, you're too um, generous in your assessment of, of these corporations and the people who run them. And the reason I say that is because I've spent a lot of time, and I write for a newspaper which has taken one of these corporations on, really taken them on, and you see what they're like. They're not much different from tobacco companies 
when they're threatened by a newspaper. But, but the point I was getting at is that they're f the thing that's really strange about these companies is that they're full of people, they're run by people who think of themselves as being good people, nice folks, cool. Interestingly, these same nice folks never let their own kids use this stuff, by the way. That's interesting. It's like they're like sausage makers who never let people eat their kids eat sausages because they know how the sausage is made. But, but, but the point about it is that you can have a corporation which is full of good folks, and yet the corporation itself, as a corporation, is a sociopathic entity. So I, I never thought I'd accuse you of being um, soft on, on, on corporations, but there, there's my thought. Yeah, let me uh, say, give you my uh, uh, view why the Green Movement, in particular in Germany, was so successful. Because the Greens were not only able to lay out a theory of ecological future, but they also had entrepreneurs who were out to make money in the capitalistic market, if you want to call it like that, with wind energy, sun energy, and so on. And they were really successful. They showed this can work. So um, I think in the modern social movements, we cannot rely anymore on class identity. We must try to convince people, and we also must be ready to welcome those who make the choices which are good for democracy and a good functioning of societies, and these can also be entrepreneurs. So I don't know the psychology of, you know, inside Google and Facebook, I mean, I read all these articles, but, you know, there are thousands of people working there, and I would say, you know, anybody who wants to engage really in democracy should be welcome, and if entrepreneurs make the choice, for example, to go green, and they have been very successful in the past, I would welcome that as much as I would welcome that the financial market makes choices on whether to invest in unsustainable uh, surveillance capitalism business models. I think they are unsustainable because, you know, it now starts, the downfall starts with the naming and shaming, or whether people say, okay, we are going to set up a fund like it has happened in the, for the green economy, which makes a choice to invest in uh, data models which are sustainable, with res respect in individual rights and uh, uh, democratic um, decision making. So I think you know, we are moving in this direction and I would just say anybody who wants to move with us, financial markets, entrepreneurs, they're welcome. We should not send them away just because they're entrepreneurs. And I actually do think that you know, Apple is I'm not saying we should trust any corporation, but I would say Apple makes a few choices which for the time being, I would say, are better than the others, but it's easy for Apple because they sell devices. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I've abused my position as chairman. Now, you can, you can, uh, you can go back at me. You can go anywhere you like. So, so it, you, have, you start. Commenting on yeah. Your response, for example, to the things that your colleagues said. Well, first of all, I find it all so, <laughs> um, how shall I express it? Uh, I've spent a lot of time alone in the last seven years. <laughs> so it's really um, wonderful and, and thrilling to hear how you're each, you know, making sense and, and, and um, uh, moving uh, with what I've what I've um, endeavored to contribute and and building on it and and taking it forward and that is so so exciting uh, for me um, and exactly what I had hoped for. Uh, so um, I I find so much of of interest in in what each of you have said and let me just touch on a couple of of highlights. Um, one is. Um, uh, David, I thought your insight about this um, contradiction of surveillance capitalism in the achievement of total certainty, thereby lowering the value of prediction, um, is you know, absolutely um, uh, profound and uh, hit, hitting an important target and, um, and really uh, opens up that vista that I'm, I'm very interested in, in seeing how we move through that door and what we, what we find there, which is what is an instrumentarian society? Uh, not because we want to go there, but because we have to understand its implications so precisely so that we, we don't go there. 
And uh, you've just given us one, um, one glimpse into that door, and I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, Francesca, uh, as we already know, <laughs> I, I, um, I feel like the work that you're doing is sort of the embodiment of, uh, of, of what needs to come next. Um, and people have been, since the book has been published, you know, I've been in America going around talking about the book uh, and now uh, here for a few days, but inevitably, especially perhaps in America, but uh, the first question or one of the first questions, the first question is what is surveillance capitalism? And the second question is what do we do about it? <laughs> and we skip everything in between. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, so there's a, there's a great eagerness and a great hunger to know what do we do about it. And I should say, Paul, um, when the book was originally outlined, uh, what you've suggested for the second volume was supposed to be part of this book. But then as I went along, it became clear that that would make it uh, an even longer journey. And somewhere along the line, my editor had a stroke <laughs> as to how long it was already becoming. So we actually did table that for the idea of a second volume. Uh, and maybe there's a collaboration among us here uh, to create that second volume uh, because nothing would make me happier than a collaboration after these years. Um, so w when I try to answer the question of uh, what do we do about it, I see, um, I see the answers coming from three dimensions. And these dimensions are all represented here. Uh, one dimension is uh, mustering the resources of our democratic institutions for a new generation of law and of regulatory institutions that now have the privilege of standing on the shoulders of the GDPR uh, and, and driving that even further into the specific ways that we um, interrupt and outlaw the mechanisms of surveillance capitalism by going back to first principles. And I'll, I'll come back to that thought in a moment when I talk about Francesca. Um, the, the second arena where I see a possibility for solutions, so we have solutions that must and can only come through democracy. Um, and then there are other solutions that I believe um, can come from the market. In other words, there can be competitive solutions here. Uh, and you've opened on to this a, a little bit in, in your last remarks, Paul. Um, but the, the idea, there's, there, nothing is perfect in the world, and David and I have had this argument over a very long dinner one night. <laughs> uh, he's perhaps more of an idealist than I am, but nothing is perfect in the world. Um, but especially now, if we see democracy um, beginning to, 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 to move further toward this interrupting and outlawing, that's really opening a space for new kinds of competitors. One way to think, you know, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the notion of the privacy paradox. Whenever there's a survey about people's online behavior and they, and they learn about the kinds of things that are being done backstage, everybody says, I reject this. Even a couple of weeks ago, new Facebook uh, research uh, issued by the Pew Research, you know, PEW, you know, even today, people don't realize what's going on backstage. And when they're informed, they say no. This goes all the way back to the early 2000s. Chris Hofnagel and Jen King did well-known research about this in California in 2008. People say they don't want it. They reject it. They want to be protected from it, but they continue to use it. And so that's called a privacy paradox. I say it's not a privacy paradox. It's not a paradox at all. It's many things, including a market failure that uh, nobody wants to be forced into this illegitimate quid pro quo. That in order to exercise you know, my fundamental needs for social participation, uh, I have to give away so much. This is illegitimate, no 21st century citizen should be put in, in this draconian uh, quid pro quo kind of entrapment. And so that market failure is also a market opportunity. In fact, a world historic one, because anybody who steps into this space, and it's not gonna be one savior, it's not gonna be one company, it's not gonna be one Apple, it's gonna be an alliance of like-minded 
uh, established country, uh, companies, uh, entrepreneurs, a new, that can establish a new ecosystem. Because surveillance capitalism is no longer, it's not Google, it's not Facebook, it's an ecosystem that now stretches across every economic sector. Ford Motor Company has just declared that they're joining the surveillance capitalist ecosystem. We could talk about that. The point is that um, anybody who enters this in a serious way has the opportunity to have literally every person on earth as a customer, uh, or at least every person who has any way connected to the internet. Because as I said when I, when I began my remarks, if you ask anyone, they will all say no. None of us would choose this. So that's the second dimension of solution. And the third dimension is the new forms of collective action. In the, in, in, and when we, when we decided to tether and constrain the, the, raw, excessive in, uh, uh, the raw excesses of industrial capitalism, you know, we look to institutionalizing collective bargaining and related forms of collective action as a critical part of the solution. And to me, what Francesca and her work in the EU and now in Barcelona, what, what this work represents is the apotheosis of the, of the exploration and the pioneering of what are these new forms of collective action. They involve, of course, democracy. They involve civil society. They involve our cities. And the fact that you are working now, Sitio Barcelona, to me is so incredible because the city really is the crucible now, the place where instrumentarian power will be tested and where, in, in, and where uh, from the point of view of surveillance capitalism, if they can own the city, they can own the polis. That really is the sequence. Uh, you know, as I, I write about the game Pokemon Go, and I won't go into the details, suffice to say that Pokemon Go uh, is actually um, a dry run, a kind of experimental laboratory for figuring out uh, how you actually would run a Google city in which computation replaces politics and replaces democratic politics and its contest. And, um, and conflict and uncertainty, which is what we love and need and cherish about democracy and indeed about human life itself. So uh, here, we have, um, here we have the uh, insights into the contradictions of capitalism, uh, insights into the democratic response, the market response, and the collective action response, all in this conversation in this past half hour. So that really is breathtaking and thrilling. And, uh, and just to go back to what you said, John, um, the huge category error that has been foisted on us is the idea, as the Google and Facebook leaders have uh, recounted over and over again, everything that we're talking about is simply the inevitable, inevitable expression of digital technology. From winners take all to the idea, to quote Eric Schmidt, search engines do retain information. Search engines do not retain, surveillance capitalists retain. Right? That is the fundamental category error that has been foisted on us. Humans make it, humans can unmake it. I am tremendously optimistic because I think our societies, our democratic societies in our history we have already got experience under our belts of taming raw capitalism and tethering it to the interests of humanity, of individuals, and of democracy. We did it to end the Gilded Age, we did it in the Great Depression, we did it in the post-war period, and we do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We have, uh, I think, about 15 minutes before the chairman of this August body takes me forcibly from the stage. Um, we, we have time for a few comments or, or questions, um, and I'll take you in order of appearance. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah go. First of all, thank you very much. I've been waiting for this book ever since you wrote the article in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung years ago. So I'm really excited to be here. 
I work for uh, Privacy International, and in many ways we are trying to find exactly that, what you describe in your book. And I have two questions for the entire panel. The first is, half the world's population is now online, but the vast majority of people live in countries that don't fall neatly into the US-China distinction, and they live in places where there are hardly any laws or protections uh, against that, that protect data, and where the relationship between government and companies is also more complicated. So my question is, how optimistic are you for these places uh, that, that regulation is the answer? Um, the second question is, you talk about the informational asymmetry, and our experience is too that the vast m most people don't have no idea how advertisement works. But at the same time, also, the attention economy has changed how news and scandals work. So in the past, you would uncover a scandal, it's on the front page of a newspaper, and things would change. And we notice that you uncover something, there's a scandal, and then people forget and move on. How can we bridge that informational asymmetry at a time where the truth and attention and the news cycle have been transformed by the very thing that you're describing? Thank you. We did, well, okay, let's take three. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, next one, please. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, so my question is for Professor Zuboff. Uh, my name is Natalie Marischel. I work at Ranking Digital Rights. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about... Hi. <laughs> it's nice to meet in person. Uh, in the book, you talk a lot about um, the concept of the, the first text and, and, and the second text. And I found that, that distinction to be incredibly... And I'll let her hopefully explain it for us. Um, uh, incredibly useful in understanding um, perhaps uh, why it is that even though Google pioneered um, this, this economic uh, logic, uh, it's Facebook that's getting uh, all, the, all the PR flack. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, if, and I'm wondering if, if that distinction of the first text and the second text and, and the porosity between the two uh, can, can help perhaps understand uh, why that is. So if you could uh, offer some comments on that, I'd be grateful. Thank you, that's great. And Sarah, you? Hello, thank you for your great work. Um, I'm an information security specialist, and I do see governments and organizations around the world monetizing and abusing the data of users around the world. But the opposite is true in this age of transparency. As a citizen, I have unparalleled access into what governments are doing, like from the Snowden affair, from the Office of Personal Management breach in the United States, and very few governments have even a clue about how to secure their systems. So my question is, what's the impact of the average citizen having unparalleled transparency and access into the behavior of governments and organizations around the world? Thank you. Right, three, three questions. Do you want to go first? Can I just come back on that first one? Yeah, I'd just like to come back on that, that last point immediately because it's just not true. Um, the Snowden revelations gave you a tiny percentage of a few months' worth of training documents from one agency in one part of the world. They were a tiny, tiny amount of documents, and even those haven't all been analyzed yet. You know, what was true then isn't true now anymore in any case. It's a tiny window. We're convinced because of the massive amount of stuff that we saw a lot of what was going on. We didn't see a lot of what was going on. I think it's a really big mistake to, make, to think that these occasional, and bear in mind it's a whistleblower, it wasn't an official process of transparency by which the government was granting us access. You know, these things are still kept very secret, they are locked down, and we see very little, very small windows into these things on very, okay, very small occasions. I can talk to you about this after as you want, because my PhD was about the NSA over 40 years, so um, it's really not true that we have unparalleled transparency in that sense at all. Sorry. Okay, now the other questions were how optimistic were we about um, the position in many countries of the world which are not? Maybe I can take that. Um, I mean, first of all, I just wanted to reinforce this point about this transparency and illimited access to power. No. I mean, first of all, uh, Snowden is in exile. Julian Assange is locked in a room without a fair trial. I mean, people that are exposing government power and big corporation power do not really, are not protected enough. So, I mean, for instance, one of the big efforts that government should do is really to 
turn around the question of transparency and make power more transparent, changing the relationship between power, I mean, the state and citizens or corporation and citizens, and everybody less transparent so we can have strong encryption that protects our rights. So we really need to, to turn it around. Uh, for the question of digital colonialism, because I would frame it a little bit that way, I mean, uh, I think the risk that I see on, let's say, developing country that is not China or the US is that very much, and Europe, actually, let me do this provocation. I think that we are becoming digital colonialized. I mean, we are a colony right now. I mean, if you look at what kind of sovereignty we have, we do not own any more software, hardware, the cloud, the data is not in Europe. I mean, we've been in fact colonized. And so we have to take back that digital sovereignty in order to direct the, I mean, to, to decide collectively and democratically the direction of technological change. And I think this is happening, for instance, look at India. Right now, first of all, they blocked the kind of uh, Facebook basics and they blocked Facebook to provide access to the internet because they understood that there was a trap into the, locked them into the Facebook ecosystem and not into access to a neutral open internet and then now India wants to develop a sovereign digital stack because they understood that this digital sovereignty also means economic political uh, sovereignty and I think more and more developing countries will have to not fall into the kind of colonization from China or the US, but develop an independent path. It's almost like develop an independent path to national economic development, right? In the kind of um, uh, industrial capitalist um, way. So I think that for them, uh, the, the, the solution is going to be to try to become more autonomous, maybe embrace um, free software, interoperability, uh, data rights and control of data from the citizens and try to develop their own path uh, for development. Thank you. Which will be much easier once uh, we've written about your work. <laughs> oh yes, yes. No, definitely because I mean I, I think this is the big the big yeah the, the well what we're doing in Barcelona goes along those way. We are building a decode project which actually goes uh, towards what Shosanna is saying because I think that we can think that that will become a competitive advantage also for Europe but also for other developing countries. So if you take the opportunities uh, for instance that are emerging to build decentralized privacy enhancing and right preserving critical digital infrastructure that will enhance uh, civic participation and civic action, this is an immense competitive advantage and an opportunity for all of you here. I mean, we have the best crypto experts in Europe, so you have to build the infrastructure that we need. I mean, I, I'm convinced we cannot rely on Facebook, Apple, or Google to build it for us, but also not on Alibaba. I, yeah, I think um, um, this book is also a very good opportunity to think about the function of the technical intelligentsia uh, in these movements. I really think um, um, it's now the time for technologists to get into these things, to read this book, um, and um, to ask for the purpose. What are, uh, am I working for? What am I innovating for? And social movements have always been strong if, uh, uh, you know, there was a pact between those who think in terms of democracy and, uh, let's say, uh, you know, political science and social matters and those who develop the technology and understand it. And um, so I think um, also these things can start uh, when we talk about the big word of democracy or GDPR and the world, you know, it's good that we discuss the big issues. And I would say, you know, the parallel here is climate change. It's a huge endeavor to try worldwide to spread good rules on data protection. But we also need to break down things more in the direction of Francesca and ask ourselves, for example, you know, uh, normally in a city, it, one would expect that the city council and people actually decide how traffic is routed and how this works. So are there new ways where we can say, well, you know, we can use Google Maps and Waze and so on, but we want the city government to have a role here. Uh, right now, many of these democratically decided functions are taken over and taken away uh, by these technological systems and no questions asked. Maybe in, uh, probably in Barcelona some questions are asked. And uh, so I think there um, we have to be ready, not only always discuss the big world, but also do a practical work on a, in a very granular way and not necessarily chasing them away. And, you know, if they have the best technical solution, fine. But 
open up for democratic control um, and um, um, citizens not only talking and being heard, yes, but also decision-making uh, uh, powers, for example, you know, which preference the algorithm gives, gives to bicycles or, or to walking, uh, walking people, just to take a very practical example. So I think this is going to be the challenge, number one, how can we build democracy also on the small scale, in the health system, in transport and so on, into this system, and by the way, also in the relevant legislation. And the second thing, I think where technologists, and um, this is a little bit relating to Tim Berners-Lee initiative of the new internet, are also probably important uh, to, to join and for them to join uh, this, this new uh, enlightenment, is to think about how new technology developments can counter and make actually unattractive economically this total, this total centralization of all the data in one pot. This new idea of learning at the edge, uh, you know, having um, AI distributed, having people keep their own data and uh, let service providers only use them, but actually we maintain control of the data, we don't put it into the big pot. All this thinking um, also, I think, has a very important technological element, and there I think technology can help and sometimes there is a substitutive relationship between technology and law, and where this substitutive relationship is good, we should work with it. And I would encourage technologists uh, also to help us, you know, the policymakers, to offer us solutions which maybe make it possible not to pass a law, but just to say this is the great technology, we adopt this. There's also, uh, the, 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 I agree with you about, about, about thinking about the local level. I, I really do. I mean, it's, and also the, there's, there's a kind of crazed architecture that we currently use at the Internet of Things level. I mean, uh, some of the some of the devices that are now toys touted for the Internet of Things are beyond satire. For example, um, a shower head that you can rem remotely control from your smartphone. How do you do that? Well, what happens is that your smartphone signal sends a signal to California, and California then communicates with your with your shower. Well, this is kind of lunatic in terms of technical architecture and the rest of it. The other thing is the, the kind of widespread acceptance by, I guess, the, the political public in a way of this uh, Silicon Valley myth about the impotence and incompetence of the state. And I was thinking about this the other day, and that there's a, there's a, there's a page in the memoirs of Alistair Darling, who was the the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time of the banking collapse in 2008. And, and on that page, there's a simple, re re he reports, uh, I, think, I think it's his, he, that he and Gordon Brown, then the British Prime Minister, in the small hours of one morning, they stood together in a room in 10 Downing Street, where the Prime Minister lives, and they signed a single piece of paper, a single piece of paper, which nationalized the world's biggest bank. So it's not true that the state's impotent, it's just that at the moment, as Susanna says in her book, that it's been asleep at the wheel for a long time in relation to this stuff, I think. And, and you know, it's about time it woke up. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree entirely about both with Shoshana and yourself and, and Francesca about the role of the city in this. Um, in North America, though, we get signals both ways. Sometimes it seems that there are really exciting, innovative initiatives going on, like in Oakland, which has you know, issued one of the world's first anti-surveillance ordinances that will assess all proposals for surveillance in the city you know, but by democratic means. And on the other hand, you've got places like Toronto, you know, where I am, which is currently basically going full throttle into allowing Sidewalk Labs and Alphabet Google subsidiary to basically have a chunk of its city to operate as an experimental um, test bed for its technologies. And we've been fighting this, and the public has been indeed fighting this, but we haven't had a, a wink of support from any level of government in Canada. The whole, um, you know, basically discourse around this is that this is just a wonderful opportunity. This is the future. Um, and you saw this in the undignified scramble for Amazon HQ2 as well. The cities were willing to sell their souls, sell their mothers, you know, for anyth anything for to have Amazon come to their city. New York, where it's finally landed, has basically given up a site that was reserved for social housing to solve some of those urgent problems of housing in New York to accommodate Amazon's tech bros coming in with their you know, scooters and whatever else they have. This is, you know, there's, there's signals both way and we need to be very strong as citizens. Um, it's great that people like Francesca exist, but most cities don't have a Francesca. Yeah. More of you perhaps need to become Francesca's in your city. Um, and we need to actually get back 
you know, local municipal politics and have a strong fight at that level, because that's where it's going to happen, I think, in many cases. Okay, thank you very much. We really do have to stop. Um, I'd like to ask you, please, to join me in thanking this wonderful panel. <laughs>